What I want to do for the rest of today, if it's okay with you, and I'm not asking, so we're just going to do it anyway, is to, I want to talk to you about Baptist history. And I want to talk to you about Baptist distinctives. But before I can explain to you the Baptist distinctives, I have to explain to you a little bit of Baptist history. Now, let me say this. Baptist history is a subject that we could go into for hours. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to, as briefly as I can today, um, go through this idea of, of, of who we are as Baptist people. But, uh, so I'm going to try to explain this to you, and then we're going to go through some Baptist uh, distinctives, and, and we'll, be, we'll, we'll be done. I'll try not to take too long, but look, if, this, is, this is just the truth, all right? This is the Word of God, and um, the history is, some of it's the Word of God, some of it's just history, but we're going to tie it into the Word of God here in a minute. If you got to go, go, all right? But I want to uh, explain to you some of these things, all right? So here's what I'm going to do. Here's a line. This is a timeline, okay? This line represents a movement of believers that was started by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, died for our sins, and the Bible says that he, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He started a movement of whatever you want to call it, believers, the local New Testament church, uh, a, a church movement, and, and th this line represents that uh, movement. Now, what I want you to understand is this. During, I'm going to fall off here. During the initial, the first initial part of, of this church movement that the Lord Jesus Christ started, th for the first 34, 35 years, all right, good night, okay, from about 30 AD, right, Jesus started his ministry when he was 30 years old, the, the clock begins at his birth, so around 30 AD to about, uh, let's see, 64 AD, these believers were persecuted, were under persecution, and I'm sorry about my handwriting, or I'm, you should have sat up front if you can't see it, but they were persecuted by the Jews. Now, if that offends you, you haven't read the Bible. Because if you read your New Testament, you'll find that the people, Paul is going all over the world, and who keeps throwing them in prison? Who keeps stoning him? Who keeps following him around and protesting against him, rallying up the Gentiles? It's the Jews. For the first 30, 34, 35 years of this movement, there was a persecution coming from the Jews anti-Christianity. Now, around 70 AD, the Jews were basically destroyed by the Roman Empire, and we're no longer in a position to persecute believers. And by the way, let me say this. During this time, this group of people began to be called Christians. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't you don't have to turn there, but let me read for you from, uh, I got the reference up here. Acts 11.26 says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Acts 11.26 tells us that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And by the way, they were, I believe, they were called Christians by their persecutors. It was a mocking title because the word Christian means little Christ. And they were saying, these people, they're like a bunch of little Christ. They're Christians. And of course, the name just stuck on. And they were called Christians. They were persecuted by the Jews. 70 AD, a man by the name of Titus, he was a Roman general who later became a Roman empire, destroyed the temple, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. All right? Now, this is important for, for several reasons, and I don't have time to get into all of it, but let me say this. The reason that this is, is important, that the temple was destroyed, is because the temple being destroyed was actually predicted by Christ. Christ, in the New Testament, predicted that the temple would be destroyed. And 35 years later, it was. That's a big deal. Now, here's the thing. The temple's destruction is not found in the New Testament at all, okay? It's not referred to. Most people believe, and I would agree with this, that the New Testament was completed by, oh, good night. I need one of these homeschoolers to come up here and. Most people believe that the New, oh, that is terrible. Sorry. New Testament completion. Most people believe, and I agree, that the New Testament was probably completed 
by 70 AD. And here's why. If Paul or John was still writing New Testament scriptures after 70 AD, they probably would have mentioned the destruction of the temple. Because it's such a big deal that Christ himself, not a prophet, Jesus from his own mouth, predicted the destruction of the temple. The fact that the destruction of the temple is not mentioned in the New Testament shows us that probably, and I'm not dogmatic on it, but probably the New Testament was completed before 70 AD. Now that's important for other reasons, and I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but I want you to understand this. The New Testament scriptures that we have are not legends that were handed down to us over a period of thousands of years. Okay? They were written by eyewitnesses within the lifetime of those witnesses. That's important to understand. And again, that's a whole other sermon for another day. But here's what I want you to understand. The New Testament was more than likely completed before 70 AD, probably around 64 AD. From 30 AD, the time of the ministry of Christ, the ascension of Christ, to 64 AD, there was Jewish persecution. Now here's what I want you to understand about that, all right? Let me grab this color. During this time, of the completion of the New Testament. Um, I'm not going to give myself enough room. During this time of the completion of the New Testament, there was already false scriptures being written, false gospels being preached, false doctrines being taught. Now, I'm not, you don't have to turn there. If you want to, you can. Let me just read for you. 2 Corinthians 2.17, we already saw it. Paul wrote, For we are not as many who corrupt the Word of God. Already during the time of Paul's writing the New Testament, there was people corrupting the Word of God. Paul also wrote to the church in Galatia. Galatians 1, 6 through 7 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you out of, his, uh, out of the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. The fact that Paul is writing to the, the church in Galatia, talking about the fact that there are people perverting the gospel of Christ, proves that during this time there was already false scriptures, false gospels being preached, false doctrines, false believers. You understand? Everybody with me up to this point? Now, after, the, after around 64 AD, 70 AD, during the temple de, after the temple destruction, the Jews basically quit persecuting believers, but there was a new persecution which came from the Roman Empire. Now, remember, the Roman Empire rules the world at this time. And by the way, Daniel predicted this predicted that the Roman Empire would persecute, uh, would persecute believers. During the, during the time of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire began to persecute believers. And this took place, history tells us, and we're not dogmatic on any of this, we're only dogmatic on what the Bible says, but history tells us that this took place from between 64 AD to about 312 AD. 64 AD, 312 AD is while the persecution of the Roman Empire to God's people, to believers, happened. Now something very uh, interesting happened in 313 AD. Here's what happened. The Roman Empire for all of these hundreds of years had been persecuting believers. When the Jews were persecuting Christians, the Christian movement, religion, group just, just grew. Whenever persecution happens, it always uh, allows uh, things to grow. You know, the, the, the God's people get excited during persecution. They, they do more during persecution. During the Roman Empire, there was 10 consecutive Roman persecutions that came to the, to the, to the Christianity, and they didn't, kill, they didn't kill off Christianity. It just grew. It just expanded. There was more people being saved. More churches started. More uh, the gospels being preached. 313 AD, there comes a Roman Empire by the name of Constantine the Great. Now, Constantine the Great... The story goes, and I, don't, I think I'm sure it's either made up or it was a devil that appeared to him, is that he saw a vision. And in the vision, there's all sorts of different aspects of the story, but in the vision, they say, they say that he saw a cross with a banner. It was on fire. And there was a term on there that says, by this symbol ye shall conquer. And he basically 
took the attitude that the Roman Empire was not snuffing out Christianity. They were not killing it off. They were just making it more popular. So he took this idea that if you can't beat them, join them. And he, quote unquote, converted to Christianity, and he didn't, but he said he did. And he held a council in which he invited believers to meet with him because he wanted to create a state church. He wanted to create a church that would be a church for the entire uh, Roman Empire. And he invited believers to come and help him create that, that church. Now, here's the thing. New Testament believers that are saved, they know you can't legislate Christianity. And they're against the government being in control of a church. So guess what? These people didn't show up to that meeting. But guess who did? A bunch of false doctrine. A bunch of false gospel. A bunch of false scriptures believers showed up to this meeting. And this meeting basically created a, the first universal church in history. Now keep in mind, the... The Roman Empire rules the world. This became the state church of the Roman Empire. They created what became known as the Roman Universal Church. Now, we talked about it in the first sermon in this series. Is there a such thing as a universal church? No. They're local assemblies. But they created the Roman Universal Church, which was the church of the entire world because it was a church of the Roman Empire who ruled the world. Now, in Rome, they spoke Latin. The Latin word for universal is... Catholic. They created what is now known as the Roman Catholic Church. And let me tell you something, the Roman Catholic Church teaches a bunch of false doctrines. They teach that salvation is by works. They teach that you have to get baptized to be saved. They teach that Jesus is not the head of the church, the Pope is. There's no biblical authority. Their authority comes from the Pope and, and the traditions of their church. But that's what they created. Now, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you this because you need to understand this to understand who we are as Baptists. This basically went on for years and years and years and years and years. And during 1517 AD, a man by the name of Martin Luther basically created a new movement which became to be known as the Protestant Reformation. Good night. That's why we don't hand out my notes. The Protestant Reformation. Okay? Now, it wasn't just Martin Luther. Another famous Protestant was John Calvin. Another famous Protestant was John Knox. And there's lots of other famous Protestants that you've probably never heard of. But there was all sorts of them. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The reason they're called Protestants is because they were protesting the Roman Catholic Church. They were saying the Roman Catholic Church is teaching false doctrines, and we're going to protest the Roman Catholic Church. And here's what I want you to understand. These people did not come from here. They came from here. John Calvin, Martin Luther were Catholic priests, protested the Roman Catholic Church and basically created their own Protestant churches known as Presbyterians, known as Lutherans, known as all sorts of different religions that came out of Catholicism. Now here's what I want you to understand. During this time, Jews persecuted Christians. During this time, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians. During this time, which is known in history as the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church persecuted Christians. When the Protestant Reformation came along, the Catholic Church and Protestants persecuted these people. And here's what I want you to understand. All throughout history, there have been a group of people that got their faith and doctrines from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave it to the apostles, who gave it to Paul, who gave it to another Christian, who gave it to another Christian, who gave it to another Christian, who gave it to another Christian. To another Christian. They were first called Christians by their persecutors. Throughout history, they were known as different names. But these Christians believed in certain things. Number one, they believed in the, in the authority of Scripture that the Bible was the authority, and that therefore no pope or government should be their authority. 
They believed in the autonomy of the local church, that the local church should be self-governing and that it should never come under the authority of a government or a denomination. They believed in the priesthood of the believer, that the Bible says that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and that I did not need to go to a priest in order to have access to God, that I could have access to God on my own through the Holy Spirit and through the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed in the inspiration and preservation of Scripture, that the Bible was infallible, and that they did not need a priest to explain it to them or to teach them what it really meant. They believed in separation, that they did not have to go and join themselves with the Roman Empire in order to be a legit church. They believed in the office is set forth in scripture of a pastor and a deacon and an evangelist and they did not believe that they needed a pope or a bishop or a board of directors or anything to come over them they believed in soul winning these were evangelistic believers and guess what these evangelistic believers began to do these believers began to get these people saved and these people began to get these people saved and when Catholics started getting saved and Protestants got, started getting saved and they started joining themselves with these believers, guess what they started doing? They started baptizing them. Because when a Catholic gets saved and a Protestant gets saved and when they truly believe on Christ, then the first thing that they're taught is, hey, your baptism was unscriptural because you were baptized as a baby. And the Bible teaches that baptism in Acts 8, 36, 37, and 38 comes after salvation. So they began to re-baptize these new converts. And I want you to understand, it wasn't that baptism was just a big deal to them. It wasn't about baptism, it was about salvation. It was about the fact that you weren't saved when you were baptized as a baby. That you weren't saved when you were uh, trusting in your works to save you. And now that you are saved, you need to get baptized. Here's what you need to understand. When these people got baptized, it was about identifying with the proper movement of church. When they got baptized, they were saying, I was once a Catholic, I was once a Protestant, but now I am identifying myself with these people. Because remember last week, we talked about the fact that baptism identifies you with Christ and with his people. And here's what you need to understand. When these people got baptized, they were signing their own death warrants. It was illegal. We are told, and again, it's a historical fact and it could be off, but we are told that 50 million believers were killed by, you ever heard of Bloody Mary? The Catholic queen that killed a bunch of believers. Why? Because they were getting rebaptized. It wasn't about baptism. They were getting saved and getting scripturally baptized. They were getting saved and they were identifying themselves with these people. These people were called many different names. But eventually, in the same way that they were called Christians in a mocking form from their persecutors, these people began to be called a name in a mocking form. They were called Anna Baptist. The word Anna means re. They were marked, mocked. You're one of those re-baptizers. You're one of those people that thinks you, someone has to get re-baptized because the Roman Catholic Church is a heretical church, because Protestants are just Catholic light, because Cro Protestants still believe in works, they just hide it better. You're one of those re-baptizers. You're one of those Anabaptists. And this group began to be called that, and eventually the term Anna was dropped and they were just called Baptists. Here's what I want you to understand. We are not Protestants. Baptists are not Protestants. Don't ever let anybody tell you, oh, you're a Protestant. No, no. Protestants came out of the Roman Catholic Church. Our people were never part of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, they rejected it back when Constantine the Great. And I'm not telling you that all throughout history they were called Baptists. I'm just telling you, this people eventually became known to be called Baptists. And here's what I believe. I believe that if salvation was a chain, if salvation was a chain that I hooked myself up to, and I was able to hook myself up to a, a physical chain, and I pulled back on that chain of salvation, it would take me to my father, who gave me the gospel as a young child and got me saved. And if I was to pull that chain back, it would take me to a Baptist missionary who got my father saved in Venezuela many years ago. And if I was to pull that chain back, it would take me to the person that got that guy saved. And it would take me to the person that got that guy saved. And I believe if we pull that chain back far enough, it'll take us. I believe if I shook that chain, it would shake on the shores of Galilee because the movement of Christianity started with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's always been a group of people that believed in the autonomy of the local church, that believed in the priest of the believer, that believed salvation by grace through faith, that believed that baptism was after salvation, that believed in the inspiration and preservation of Scripture.
We're not these people. We're not these people. And by the way, that's why it matters to me. That's why I fight for the name Baptist. Today you got people saying, ah, just take the name Baptist off or just don't identify. No, no, it matters to me. It means something. It means something to be a Baptist. I'm a Baptist. People died for that name. People died to be Baptist. That's why I don't feel that bad for some of you say, well, I can't be baptized. I'm, I'm kind of shy. These people died to get baptized. I think you can get over your little shyness. I think you can over, you know, they, they, they believe in this, in this idea of Christianity so far. We handed you a bookmark. Do you have it? In your little bookmark, we've got what are commonly known as the Baptist distinctives. What, what was done, and I didn't do this, this was made up. My pastor taught me this when I was 14 years old, and I'm teaching it to you today. The word Baptist can be used as an acronym, and there are Baptist distinctives. These are things that we believe as Baptists that differentiate us from everyone else. The B stands for biblical authority. Not a pope, but the word of God. The A stands for the autonomy of the local church. That we're not part of a denomination. We're not part of a government system. And by the way, let me say this. One day, this guy is going to be called the Antichrist. And he's going to tell people, come join me in a universal church. And most of these people are going to join that. But in the end times, there will still be a group of people who will say, no, you can't join the government system. No, there's the autonomy of local church. And I would submit to you that they're probably going to be Baptists. Amen. <laughs> the A stands for the autonomy of the local church. The P stands for priesthood of the believer. We don't need a pope. We don't need a priest. We have access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The I stands for the inspiration and preservation of Scripture, what we just talked about, that we believe that the Word of God is inspired, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. They believed in separation. You see the separation here? Not just for the church, but in their personal lifestyle, to be called out from the world. They believed in the I put on here three offices, other people say two offices, uh, and the offices that the Bible gives us, the pastor, the deacon, and the evangelist, that the authority structure is within the self-governing body of the church. And of course, since we're more than one Baptist here today, the last S there they, stands for soul winning, personal, and as a church, they believe that their job was to evangelize the world. I hope this makes sense to you. This is who we are. This is where we came from. This is why we're not taking the name Baptist off the sign. This is why I'm, I'm not sending, I'm not laying my hands on a man and ordaining him to go start anything than a Baptist church. Because this is who we are. And hopefully you understand now that not all churches are created equal. And there are biblical doctrines, biblical characteristics that make us a biblical church. We're not perfect. But we're doing our best, we're doing our best to be able to pattern ourselves after the Word of God. To keep those distinctives that make us biblicists. Because like I told you before, when the Bible is your boss, you're a Baptist. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for allowing us to be able to communicate truth. Lord, I pray that, I know we went through a lot today, I know we went through a lot and we probably shouldn't have. But Lord, I pray that there'd be people here today that would learn these doctrines, learn these beliefs, and stand for them. Lord, I pray that you would raise up a generation of young people that would say, I'm a Baptist. The Bible is my authority. I have access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need any priest. I'm going to live a separated life. I'm going to be a soul winner. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. In your precious name I pray, amen.